sorry, um, St. Mark's Hospital. Hi, my name is Chris Martin. I do, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I do mostly upper extremity stuff. Uh, I still do a lot of trauma. My practice is probably 60% hand, 40% shoulder. Uh, I have been here for 21 years now and seen a lot of changes. We just broke ground on a new tower outside. Uh, I, at this point, I'm the uh, primary hand person here. We have a group of eight subspecialists currently, and we've got a few more people probably joining us this summer. So uh, I was going to talk today about carpal tunnel syndrome, which is uh, the most common peripheral nerve compression, and it's probably the one entity in the hand that everybody's heard of and they know. And uh, you know, we get a lot of people in who have any type of hand trouble tends to be just attributed to that. So. Uh, which it's not, um, and, and hopefully after today we'll have a better understanding of what we're looking at, what we're dealing with. Ah. My, <laughs> I don't seem to be able to go forward. What happens if you click the arrow on your keyboard to move it forward? That's how I usually go forward and it's not doing anything. And it's stuck. Let's see if we have you stop sharing and reshare again. It may just need a reset. Uh, still no arrow and I don't see a cursor to move. Jim, do you have any suggestions? I'm not quite sure why it would be stuck. I wonder, that's just double clicking it. There, there we go. Uh, anyway, so apparently I can move now. So uh, carpal tunnel is an actual anatomic space. It's named after the anatomy of the carpal bones or the small bones that make up the wrist uh, or the carpus. And if we look at these in an axial plane, uh, they actually do form a tunnel. So. We're just going to look at the anatomy. So these are the four bones. The ridge of the trapezium here is actually out of this plane looking at us. And over here, the hook of the hammock comes up out of the plane. So that forms the U. Uh, and then here we are in the axial plane. So we've got. Dr. Martin, we're not seeing anything except your first page. Ah. I have a stop sharing. I think I'll go in and out. There we go. Now we can see it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to. Now my arrows don't work. So. Um, so uh, this is the anatomy of the carpal tunnel, and that may be as far as we get. Uh, these are the carpal bones here. There's the transverse carpal ligament, which comes over this sort of U shape in the bones to form a tunnel. These are the flexor tendons. This is the median nerve, and this is a case of median nerve entrapment. Uh, but I don't know that I'm going to be able to advance because it doesn't seem to be doing much. Or I guess if I double click, it does. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're all right. I'll double click rather than the arrows. Maybe that'll take us all the way through. 
Uh, these are the soft tissues added. This is the median nerve coming through the carpal tunnel. There is a palmar cutaneous branch, uh, which supplies innervation to the palm. The median nerve goes out to the fingers, and then one branch swings back here and supplies these muscles to the thumb. <clears throat> Uh, there's some variation in this anatomy, uh, like there is in everything we deal with, but by and large, we're looking at innervation to the thumb index and long fingers, as well as the radial half of the ring finger. The small finger is not involved in this. That's a different nerve. The ulnar nerve innervates that. Uh, the motor branch, which comes to these muscles, uh, varies significantly, whether it goes through the ligament or not. Uh, and that sometimes has surgical implications. I... I'll seem to be able to go backwards. So, um, the one thing probably most pertinent to people and the, the big myth out there is the relationship to computers. People, in, you know, generally want to know why did this happen? What's it from? And with carpal tunnel syndrome, everybody really wants to attribute it uh, to computer use. There's really no good evidence for this. <clears throat> During the 90s uh, and the Clinton OSHA administration, uh, it was really attributed to computer use, and that engendered a lot of workplace modifications uh, without any significant impact on the incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, they've done several studies out of Scandinavia where they can follow hundreds of thousands of people uh, just stratifying the people into two job types, those that primarily use computers and those that don't. And there's really no difference between the two of them. Uh, in fact, the computers may even be somewhat protective. So, symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome are numbness, tingling. Uh, people often report uh, clumsiness with the lack of sensation in the fingers. Uh, fine motor activities, especially doing buttons, knitting, uh, can be affected. Uh, people often have pain in that nerve distribution. Uh, nighttime symptoms are very common. Uh, exacerbation with wrist flexion uh, or what I call dynamic activities. So gripping, talking on the phone, driving, uh, riding bikes, especially motorized things, uh, any type of vibrational tools can uh, aggravate this significantly. Uh, like we kind of mentioned, all hand pain is not carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, people do come in describing both pain and numbness. Uh, to try and differentiate some of this, carpal tunnel syndrome for me is more about the numbness. We're really trying to zero in on the, the nerve compression and dysfunction. Uh, we have various ways of testing the sensibility. Uh, this is a Sims Weinstein filament, uh, which basically bends at a certain pressure. And everybody has a threshold of what they're able to feel. In carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, the nerve is not able to sense being touched, uh, and it takes more pressure to sense that. Uh, over here is what we call a moving two point discrimination, uh, where people can feel that there are two points on their fingers. Uh, the closer those two points get together, the, the more difficulty we have in that. Uh, practically, these tests are used very rarely, sometimes in electrical studies, but for completeness. Uh, basically, the tingling, the paresthesias in that distribution are what we focus on. A Tonell sign is just tapping on an irritable nerve. Uh, the edge of the carpal tunnel here, uh, where that median nerve goes in, uh, the nerve tends to be irritable, and if you tap on it, it will give people an electrical sensation or a shock that goes down to the affected fingers. Phelan's test has to do with the fact that when we bend the wrist or extend it, the space in the carpal tunnel is actually decreased. Uh, so bending the wrist and having that position produce numbness, uh, generally on a timed basis, you know, anything under 30 seconds I find significant. 
Um, the production of numbness is a positive test. This is also why we get nighttime troubles because people tend to bend their wrists when they sleep, uh, but they don't wake up or shift position until the nerve has already been affected and people wake up numb, tingling, you know, and generally painful. Uh, with, <clears throat> excuse me, progression of the carpal tunnel syndrome, Earlier, we looked at these nerve branches that swing back here and supply the thenar muscles or the muscles to the thumb. And this gentleman came in with very pronounced thenar atrophy or wasting of those muscles. Uh, he had very severe carpal tunnel syndrome, had been numb 24 seven for months and months. And probably at that point has some type of permanent dysfunction in the nerve, most likely. Uh, as far as treatment, uh, there are many things available, uh, not much that has been shown to help. As far as non-operative treatment, the wearing of a splint at night, so we stay out of that flexed wrist position, uh, has been shown to help and potentially change the course of carpal tunnel syndrome. That is largely it. Uh, there's Soft evidence at best for the use of anti-inflammatories. Uh, intellectually, that makes sense. If you have some swelling within a closed space and you can decrease that swelling with the anti-inflammatory use, you potentially may make more space for the nerve. An injection, we usually use a steroid, which is an anti-inflammatory, uh, but there's not an evidence that the course of carpal tunnel syndrome will be changed with the use of an injection. Uh, operative release, which we'll touch on there basically too. There's an open release and an endoscopic release. Uh, one thing I would say is beware of the internet. When I, carpal tunnel syndrome is very common, so it's very rife. Uh, it's a fertile ground for people to sell different items to help. Uh, none of these have, you know, any kind of scientific backing. Like I said, in my mind, the one thing that does have a scientific study behind it is the use of night splinting. Uh, but any quick search is going to offer people the chance to purchase any number of things, you know, several of which I've listed here. Uh, here's a brace. Uh, this is a brace and an injection. I did have one gentleman come in with a oh, $75 green flashlight, which he was shining at his carpal tunnel syndrome in order to help it. And he was mid nineties and it worked for him. So that's, that's the way we treated him. He was happy and so was everybody else. Uh, as far as non-operative treatment, the splint is to keep this carpal tunnel as open as it can be. Uh, in general, we just recommend splinting at night. I think splinting during the day weakens the muscles of the wrist. Uh, it is going to make people prone to tendonitis and potentially invite other troubles that we may not need. Uh, in my experience, people who are needing to wear a splint most of the day are probably just going to be much happier having uh, a carpal tunnel release. Cortisone injections, which we have mentioned, uh, the idea is to put an anti-inflammatory within the carpal tunnel. The main tissue in the carpal tunnel is tenosynovium, uh, which lines the tendons. It is the fluid that makes, or it's the tissue that makes fluid for the tendons. That's how the tendons get their nutrition. If you can shrink up this tissue, make more room, again, there's potentially more room available for the nerve. Uh, but there's no evidence for a long-term relief or a long-term change in the course. Uh, I generally use an injection in instances of pregnancy when uh, pregnant women get bad carpal tunnel syndrome because of the amount of fluid that the body retains. Uh, that tends to be a reversible process. You know, shortly after delivery, most pregnancy-related carpal tunnel cases will resolve. Uh, so an injection is nice. It can help get people over symptoms, you know, and in their condition being pregnant, they, they're not looking to have surgery anyway. So that's generally my use of it. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, as far as the success of non-operative treatment, 
Uh, in general, the worse it is, the the less well non-operative treatment is going to uh, do. So if we look just here at people over 50, do worse. That in and of itself is a risk factor. Uh, duration of symptoms over 10 months. Uh, constant paresthesias, meaning numbness and tingling that is present 24-7. Uh, at that point, I will generally suggest to people that they have their carpal tunnel released. Uh, and Phelan's test, uh, like we mentioned, anything under 30 seconds is significant. So by the time you get to three of these instances, and stenosing tenosynovitis is a trigger finger or catching of the finger uh, out further in the palm, by the time we get to three of these and potentially even two of these, so just duration of symptoms over 10 months and age over 50, your chances are 17% that non-operative treatment is going to be successful. Uh, the surgical indications for carpal tunnel syndrome are two. We do see this condition traumatically. Uh, and in general, that is from something that occupies space within the carpal tunnel, uh, such as an infection, we're getting a lot of fluid in the carpal tunnel or trauma, which uh, and generally what we're referring to is a fracture, which changes the shape of the carpal tunnel. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome after a wrist fracture, even down the line can is really quite common. Uh, anything that changes the shape of the carpal tunnel generally does so in a way to make the tunnel smaller so there is less space available for the nerve. Uh, the indications for chronic carpal tunnel syndrome are pronounced sensory loss, denervation uh, that we saw, I think by the time people are getting motor atrophy to you know, any extent, they really need this released. Uh, for my practice, I tell people that if they are numb or having abnormal sensation 50% of the time or more, uh, I would step in at that point and push them towards release. Uh, but anybody who hasn't improved with the, you know, really somewhat limited non-operative measures available to us, uh, surgery makes sense. Then the question is what we're doing. So, in essence, we are cutting the transverse carpal ligament to open the carpal tunnel. That takes the pressure off of the, off of the nerve. So in this diagram, we have the median nerve coming into the tunnel. The ulnar nerve is over here. We're really ideally trying to go down the ulnar aspect, but by which I mean on the other side of the tunnel from the thumb, which is over here. Uh, on the ulnar aspect between these two neurovascular bundles and just cut the ligament. Uh, this is the old open surgery, uh, and I've seen plenty of incisions like this. Uh, the advantages of this were it was in general safe. Uh, it very rarely required a revision release because it's very difficult not to see and release everything when you have an incision that big. Uh, and the disadvantage was that repeat surgeries due to scarring uh, were more common, uh, and it was just a more painful operation. You know, people often requiring significantly more time at work. And here's just the incision off to the ulnar side of the median nerve. Uh, <clears throat> this was an example of someone I took care of postoperatively uh, who had had more of a formal open uh, release performed elsewhere. This is a case intraoperatively of a nerve in really quite bad condition. This is more healthy nerve back here. You can see this hourglass compression of the median nerve, this injection of red blood vessels. Uh, this nerve is flattened, extremely unhappy. Uh, metabolically, all the nutrition from the nerve kind of moves down towards the fingers. It moves along the nerve. And when you interrupt that, uh, it's like having a, you know, well, an hourglass compression or a band around a feeding tube or something. This kind of restricted restricted area can eventually just get scarred in. And once we start getting scar within the nerve, we really don't have any ways to treat this. So ideally, we want to get to something surgically and release this long before this process. 
so open carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, the, we had significant incisional pain, uh, much longer times back to work. Uh, there was much more scarring created around the nerve and just in general, a much slower return to doing the things that we all want to get back to. Uh, historically, people then started to do an endoscopic carpal tunnel release. And this is a device where we're basically looking at a camera out at it, what amounts to a tray. The tray goes underneath the ligament, and we know we're at the end of the ligament when we get to this fat pad. This blade, once we're there, pops up, and then we drag the endoscope back out of the carpal tunnel, cutting this ligament as we go. So we're inside the tunnel. The nerve in this picture is probably off to the left. Uh, we wanna put it in again toward the ulnar aspect of the nerve, which uh, we've drawn out here a little bit, just some landmarks. Uh, when this first started, uh, it was associated with significant, a significant incidence of nerve injuries. Uh, if you remember the diagrams, the nerves travel through the tunnel and then branch. Uh, it is very difficult looking in these fat pads to be sure that we're not getting a branch of the nerve in that area. Uh, so the incidence of nerve lacerations was significantly higher. Um, see if that, well, it won't play, but we've got pictures. So this is a ligament after we've released it. Uh, again, this is the blade that pops up and we just drag it through usually one pass, sometimes two, and we can be pretty sure that we've released this. Uh, here are some of the pitfalls earlier. I showed a, a motor branch that goes over to the thumb muscles. Here's that motor branch within the ligament itself. Uh, it is or it can be difficult to see you know, tell what we're looking at. All the tissues look kind of white, uh, so the motor branch can be identified uh, and potentially lacerated as well. Uh, endoscopic carpal tunnel release was very valuable in that it taught us that all we need to do is release the ligament. Uh, the downsides of this were that there were more nerve injuries and a higher risk of revision because if someone didn't get better after a while, you might start to think, well, did I release it all? Am I 100% sure? And if the answer becomes, well, maybe, uh, then people had a revision surgery. Uh, people then developed a two incision technique to make this safer. Uh, a two incision technique uh, involve making a small incision out towards the other side of the ligament such that those branching nerves could be identified. We could be more sure where the endoscope was. Uh, and then in the evolution of this, people decided, well, if the second incision allows me to see all this, why not avoid the other incision and just use the distal incision at the distal part of the transverse carpal ligament where the nerves branch and that kind of led to a mini incision carpal tunnel release. Again, this was useful after we knew that people who just had the ligament cut and did not have everything explored, like as was common in the old days with the larger incisions, uh, if we could get in as safely as possible, as less invasively as possible and just cut this ligament, that really is the ideal treatment. Uh, the mini incision focuses on protecting the branches just based on the location out in the palm. Uh, the idea is that you minimize morbidity but improve safety. This is a mini incision uh, patient of mine at two weeks. Again, the ligament we're after uh, runs from about here out to the distal edge is probably here. So we're going between the thenar muscles and the hypothenar muscles. So here we go down to the ligament and then cut it back this way under the skin. He's got a faint suggestion of bruising back here because we do cut all the way back into this area. The endoscopic carpal tunnel releases are essentially the opposite. There's an incision here and the endoscope comes out this way. But again, all we're doing either way is trying to cut the ligament, get in, get out, be safe and be uh, as less invasive as we can. 
uh, if we look at the two techniques, uh, the early literature showed the improved safety and lower revisions uh, with the many incisions, uh, but probably improved comfort and less morbidity as far as incisional pain with the endoscopic. Uh, I think that is true probably based on where the incision is. Over the 20 years that these two techniques have been refined, most of the current literature really does not show any difference between the two of them. Um, I, I think there's largely dealer's choice. Thank you. So I will turn it over to questions if anybody has any. And it's usually about the symptoms and kind of presentation of this. Thank you, Dar okay. um, Dr. Martin. We'll just wait for right <laughs> some questions to come in the chat box. Do you have any um, suggestions for stretches that people can do to prevent something like this from happening? Uh, there aren't any stretches or anything other than the night swims that have really been shown to change that. As far as preventative measures, uh, there's nothing that's been documented in a scientific study. So again, there, there's lots that is recommended, but as far as a study to say, yes, I condone this, uh, there's really nothing out there that's convinced me. All righty. Um, our next question is, how long does the procedures take and what is the downtime after doing it? Uh, so, in terms of recovery, I generally tell people that there are 2 recoveries as far as the incision. I think either way, both incisions are healed up to the point at 3 weeks where uh, you really don't have any restrictions. So, at that point, if you want to do push ups, you know, you may make things sore, but you're not going to damage anything. Uh, both incisions, you want to just protect from pressure typing kind of jobs, for example, that aren't putting a lot of force on that area. I think people can really go back and do when they want to. Uh, doctors being the worst patients, I did a partner of mine and he was out riding his motorcycle three days later and operating at four days. Um, as far as the actual surgical time, uh, I think people who are doing these uh, regularly, it takes probably somewhere between five to eight minutes. Uh, there's time and stuff set up you know, otherwise we've got instruments uh, that's more involved with an endoscope. Uh, there's all the arthroscopy equipment, uh, but it is a very short procedure. All right, and we have is the first picture. Is that the ligament on the inside of your wrist? I think so. I. <laughs> The thing, I don't know how I can get back to know just what the first picture uh, they're referring to is. Uh, but in general, it, it's down, you know, deep in the palm. Is that as, as far as the transverse carpal ligament? I believe so. I believe that was the one they were referring to. Yeah. So in, inside the wrist, kind of connecting the muscle areas and those. You know, connecting the tops of the U of those bones. I guess somebody... another question is. People ask me very often, why is that ligament there and what happens if you cut it and lose it? Uh, I think that ligament in general evolutionarily stabilized the tendons that go to our finger. Uh, there are similar structures in the ankle and bottom of the foot. Uh, in my mind, that ligament is left over from when we were walking on all fours. It sort of stabilized the flexor tendons to the fingers. Uh, after surgery, the ligament is still there. If you think about it, we've cut it, we've spread it apart, but that area still heals in. So the carpal tunnel is still an enclosed space. Uh, there's still some function of the ligament. Um, all you've done really is make the carpal tunnel bigger. 
next question we have is, I had a mallet finger injury and the joint is very tight after a year. Any way to help the mobility of that joint or tendon? Uh, the most balanced way is a really aggressive stretching program. The, the problem with a mallet finger is that the tendon that straightens the, the joint out there is also connected to straightening the PIP joint or the joint uh, one further back on the finger. Uh, and it is very easy surgically to disrupt the balance between those two fingers. So it can be a tricky operation and tricky therapy. There are options if just an aggressive stretching regimen doesn't uh, take care of it. Uh, but that would certainly be where I would spend a lot of energy first. Thank you. And then somebody said, can you talk about shoulder injuries as well? Do you see a lot of those or is that something that's not your specialty? Uh, no, I do treat a lot of shoulder. Uh, I mean, if there's anything specific, we, we treat everything. You know, there are shoulder replacements for glenohumeral arthritis or ball and socket arthritis. Those are common uh, as you get older. Rotator cuff disease, whether tears or inflammation is, you know, really probably best considered gray hair of the shoulder. Uh, it just has to do with the mechanics of the shoulder and all the overhead activities our lives um, now demand. Uh, it's very common to get rotator cuff irritability. Uh, the rotator cuff stuff is probably the majority of what we see, you know, outside of trauma. Um, some of the atraumatic things can be treated therapy wise. Uh, there was a big push in our literature to compare results of surgery to results of non surgical treatment of rotator cuff tears. And in the early follow up, one year, two years, there was a lot of equivalence between those two groups. Uh, but now we've had more time to look at these populations, and it's become clear that. The best outcome is a surgically repaired rotator cuff down the line, looking at five year, 10 year follow up. There's been a great study that came out just recently looking at 10 year follow up of these people. Our next question is the ergonomic keyboard seems to be very soothing to me. Does it help prevent carpal tunnel? No, but. If it's soothing to you, I think it's wonderful. And will strengthening muscles in the wrist or going to physical therapy help prevent carpal tunnel from getting worse? Uh, they do not. It's not something that can be treated with exercise. Uh, in my mind, the ergonomic keyboards are really directed at uh, tendonitis problems. Uh, exercise and stretching is directed more at uh, tendonitis problems. Uh, so I think they're very effective as far as those difficulties, uh, but as far as doing anything to impact or ultimately change the trajectory of carpal tunnel syndrome, there's no evidence that it does. And if you wait until you have severe pain and are having a hard time using your hand and arm, are you most likely to have permanent damage? Uh, assuming, um, assuming the pain and everything is from carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, in my mind, it is much easier to treat people who have moderate carpal tunnel syndrome, intermittent numbness, symptoms that come and go dynamically. Most of those people come back, they get their sutures out, the numbness is gone, they think I'm wonderful and they carry on. The worse it is from there, the, the longer the nerve takes to heal uh, and the more unpredictable it is. The, the person we have difficulty with is the, you know, say the somewhat stoic 75 year old who's come in, they have had numbness present the bulk of the time for a year more and they just finally reached a point that they're having enough nerve pain to come see the doctor. Uh, those cases, the nerve can react very haywire after surgery. It can be a long, difficult recovery, not in terms of incision, but just how the nerve reacts. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely some upsides to having it addressed 
earlier rather than later, but with the caveat that the symptoms have to be bad enough to, you know, to warrant that. Okay, and it looks like we have a follow up to the shoulder injuries. It says, "Could you talk about popping pectoralis um, tendon as it connects with the joint?" Uh, the pectoralis tendon is outside the joint. It goes over the biceps tendon, which goes through the joints. Uh, the biceps goes through a groove, and if there's damage to the groove, it will frequently pop in and out. Um, uh, the the pectoralis can be torn, it can be affected, but in, in general, I don't think of that as a etiology of popping. And the last question I have is, if you are prone to tendinitis, could the numbness be caused by tendinitis, and how can you tell the difference between this and carpal tunnel? Uh, so the carpal tunnel is a, you're looking for several signs and uh, physical exam findings. Uh, we do use an electrical study which measures the conduction of the nerve. Uh, the nerve is basically like a telephone wire and you can measure an impulse which travels uh, across the region of the carpal tunnel uh, and it will be characteristically slowed. The conduction wave will be characteristically flattened, uh, so they are good. The, the nerve studies are not 100% accurate, so I think you got to put it together with a whole clinical picture. Uh, the tendons through the carpal tunnel are a different anatomic structure. They will not give you numbness. The one issue with them is if you are truly having enough swelling in the tenus synovium, the tendon itself generally doesn't change size, but if you're having enough swelling in the tenus synovium and that tissue is taking up space in the carpal tunnel, then that might affect the nerve and give people numbness. And do you find that certain sports, um, this person wrote, such as archery, aggravate carpal tunnel? Uh, I find that weight bearing, you know, like uh, cyclists will definitely tell you that uh, this is more a question as far as what patients tell me. Uh, archery is a fair amount of grip strength. You know, we're squeezing using that. So, you know, would it aggravate things, you know, entirely that you know makes sense to me. That's different than being causal. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to prove that something causes another condition. Um, Vibrational tools, uh, vibrational sports, you know, riding an ATV, those things, motorcycle, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is very common in truck drivers, you know, driving a lot. So uh, if you're gripping something that vibrates, we know that that causes carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, even mechanical drills and, you know, guys who are doing construction will get this from that, not uncommonly. Fabulous. Thank you. You answered all the questions that we had in the chat box. It's so interesting well, that there aren't um, stretches that have been correlated with preventing something like this. So always be talking to your doctor, I guess. Yeah, I think the stretches have been recommended, uh, but have they been conclusively shown to help? No, but that's, you know, it's just one of those diagnoses. When it's that common, everybody wants to have something to help it, understandably. So, anyway, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your attention. Yes, thank you so much. Hopefully, we will have you back again, probably for shoulder injuries. It sounds like that's a popular topic as well. Anytime. You guys have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. We appreciate all your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah,